Hello guys, this is Yaakov Fein. Today is the lesson number five from uh, my training on Java, introduction to Java. You can see all previous uh, lessons, recording, video recording, by following the link at the bottom of this slide. Today we're going to continue with uh, working with uh, Swing, Java GUI with Swing. So what is Swing? And how do you go about GUI in Java? So far, we didn't create any graphic user interface so far. But what if you need to create a calculator that look, looks like a window that has buttons and everything else? You need to have some component, some GUI component, graphic user interface component. And in Java, originally there was this library called Abstract Windowing Toolkit back in the 90s. And at the end of the 90s, it was uh, replaced with the Swing framework different set of components, they were a bit lighter than the AWT. And uh, then in uh, probably 2009 or 2010, a new development started on the so-called JavaFX framework. And JavaFX is the next replacement, and so far it didn't replace, but most likely in a couple of years, people will not be doing Swing, but mainly JavaFX. But for now, Java Swing is uh, the most popular way of developing graphic user interface in Java. Hence, we are covering it today. How do you go about creating Windows in Java? When I say Windows, I mean not only Windows as an operational system Windows, but any window, any view, any viewport, so to speak. To do that, you need to create, you need to extend your class from some container, some video container, not video container, some GUI container that come with the Swing library. In particular, in this case, we're going to be starting with simple hello world. Check this out. There is a, There are classes that are related to Swing in the package Java X Swing. It uses some older classes from AWT framework, but mainly you're going to be using these uh, UI components. In this particular case, I am using JFrame. JFrame is a container that can hold other components or other, other containers. So if you want to create a window that looks like on the right hand side, hello world, it's empty, but it's a window anyway. So we will create a class that extends JFrame. So hello world extends JFrame. So at the, at the bare minimum, we will create a constructor over here, right? Hello world. And in there, we are setting the size of the window. Check it out. We are extending JFrame, right? So the method set size is called from JFrame. And we set a title on that window, hello world. The title of the window is something that you would be seeing over here on the title bar of the window. And finally set visible true. To show this uh, window, you call this method. That's about it. Then in the main methods of your class, you instantiate this hello world and it works. We will do it now, uh, pretty soon. But for now, just remember, you need to extend your class from one of the uh, visual mm, components or containers, and then uh, you need to instantiate it properly. This container, which is a JFrame, it's a, it's a top-level container, and you can put other containers in there, or components. For example, you can create, say you want to create a button. JButton is a class that comes with Swing that knows how to, how to render a button. The word render means to show it on the screen. We are rendering GUI components, not we... Java is rendering, J JVM is rendering GUI components. So you create an instance of whatever component you want to show, and then you add it to the container. In this particular case, I didn't put any anything in front of the method call uh, because it assumes the word this, So which means that I'm referring this container. What is this? This is JFrame in this case, because this code would be executed inside of the JFrame. Again, if I decide to do this. Otherwise, I if I would use the same 
code if I want to do it inside the method main, not inside the not inside the constructor, where I could I could have add, added the, my button simply like this. But if I would do it over here, I could uh, add the next line saying my hello dot add my button. Of course, you need to create this button. How the components, the graphical components, are being arranged inside the container. There are two major ways of doing this. Uh, one of the ways is you, you, you can say, don't help me with arranging. I will specifically uh, enter or program in pixels where the components should start or where the components should end. For example, you can say that I want my component to start as a X position, this pixel, say for example 20 pixels on the X, so it's from the top uh, left corner of the window, will take 50 pixels to the right, and Y, X is, mm, is going down from the top left corner of the window. So if I will say that the left corner of the button should start at the position 50, 100, it means 50 to the right, X is uh, 50 pixels and 100 down. But the second way and the uh, more popular way of creating, uh, of laying out uh, components on the screen is by using so called layout manager or layout managers. Swing has a number of layout managers that will take care of automatic arrangement of your components on the screen. Why do you even need that? You may need that because in some cases you want to allow users to change the size of the window. So if the user will, will grab the window uh, and start to extending it or maybe make it smaller, you, uh, these layout managers gives you a way to make sure that your screen will maintain relative positioning of all components in there. So basically layout managers is a way to say how to change the layout on the screen if the size screen changes. For example, uh, for example, how do we how do we add first of all how do we add a component and how do we add layout manager to the container? So you need to create an instance of some container. In the previous slide, I was creating an instance of JFrame. In this slide, I give you an example of how would you create so-called panel and add something to the panel. In turn, by the way, this panel later on can be added to the frame. So JFrame can have one or more panels, right? A panel inside may have one or more components. So this is how it goes. Now, let's see what are the steps. First. You need to create an instance of JPanel using the regular new operator. Second, you need to assign a layout manager to it, which one we will see uh, in a minute. But you need to say this panel will be controlled by so and so layout manager. Then you need to create instances of one or more components, or we call them controls sometimes, and you need to add them to the panel. After the components are sitting inside the panel, then you add a panel itself to the top level container. In our case, it will be, say, a JFrame. How do you do this? You can say uh, set content pane, the method set content pane, and give, it, give the panel to this uh, method. And finally, you can set the f f uh, frame's size and make it visible. These are the steps. What are the three main actions that you're going to be doing if you are into GUI programming? It, it pretty much not depe doesn't depend on what language or framework you use. In, we are using Java, we are using Swing, but if you'd be using something else, you still would need to do these steps. First, you need to create a nice, uh, to the best of your artistic abilities, or maybe according to some spec, you need to create the UI, the, the nice looking uh, GUI, arranging all the components. Then 
you need to write the code that will react on events that may be happening with this screen, with these components. For example, you can create a nice looking calculator, but how good is it if you click on the button, but the button don't react. So to make them react, you would need to create, write some code to react on events. These events can be user generated. For example, the user clicks on the button and we need to do something. Or they could be system events. System events is not something that happens because of the user, but it's rather something that happens because maybe the application sends some signals to the screen. For example, maybe the window gets resized. Uh, the corresponding events will be firing or dispatched, as we say, under the hood. Actually, no, this is a bad example. Uh, window gets resized. Uh, most likely it gets resized because of the user action, right? But in some cases, um, in some cases, there could be a screen, there could be a situation when the window needs to get repainted, not because the user touched the window, right? But because the user added or actually opened another window that is closing this window, right? So there could be different events, different types of events that are going under the hood. Or maybe the data arrived from the server and the data needs to be shown on the screen. User didn't touch the screen, but uh, this is something that has to be that has to be done. And of course, if the data arrived from the server, or maybe you did some calculations and it's time to show the data on the screen, then you do this re rendering and um, your program populates the UI with the data. So these are pretty much the three uh, actions or activities that you would need to do to make it work. Let's uh, start uh, creating a calculator. The first version of our calculator will be using so-called flow layout, flow layout. This may not be the best looking calculator that you've seen so far, but it is a calculator. And my goal is not to sell calculators, but to show you something about layout manager. So let's start with a simple one. So this screen has several uh, GUI components. This is a this is a text uh, label, sorry, J label. Next to it, there is a text field. In our case, we're going to be entering data in there. This 10 means it can hold 10 characters, 10 digits in our case. Then again, J label, number two. Then again, text field. Then again, J label sum and the text field to show the sum. And finally, we have a button add, the J button with add. So let's see what we do over here. First of all, we create a panel. This is a container that will hold inside all these labels and uh, text fields. J panel. We created an instance. Nobody see it yet, it's somewhere in memory. Then we create an instance of the layout managers that we want to use. In this case, as I said, we will be using flow layout. Uh, there is a number of, the, of these layouts, but we want to use flow layout. And then we say, see this variable window content points at the instance of J panel. We say this, this J panel will be controlled by flow layout. We assign a layout to this container. Next, container is ready. Nobody can see it yet. And it has no content inside. So the next step is to instantiate all these controls in memory. Again, nobody sees them, them, them yet. They're instances in memory. Now we are adding them to the panel. At this point, nobody see anything, but the panel is populated. It knows its layout manager and it's ready to be shown to the world. Finally, we will create a top level container and put the panel in there using set content pane. 
window content it's our panel with all these little components so we add it to the frame and finally we set the size of the frame in this case 400 pixels width and 100 pixels height and we, we make it visible that's about it that's about it there is a whole bunch of other layout managers as you can see flow layout grid layout box layout water layout card layout grid back layout and we'll go over them today but for now just we are trying to do very simple calculator using flow layout what is the flow layout flow layout is it's like go with the flow you we have a container j panel and the program gives to this container a label it'll put it on top Im Im imaginary row starting from the left then we want to add another com uh, uh, control say text field it'll try to fit the control on the same Im imaginary row if it fits we have a certain width of the window right let's say it's fit we want to put another one and another one and another one at some point we will reach the end of this imaginary row so the uh, so swing will start flowing components to the next row so the components flow if the screen of the window becomes wider the components may be reusing the uh, available space in the first row so that's why this the design will be like flowing uh, we will talk about the rest of the components pretty soon but for now let's concentrate on the flow layout uh, actually no let's do a quick intro of other ones grid layout grid layout it's if you want to allocate or arrange components in your container as a grid rows and columns what kind of grid you want to create you depend on the screen of course you need to ask yourself how many controls i need to put on the screen in in this example uh, say i want to have s three labels j labels three j text fields and a button total seven so that's why i decided to use uh, a grid layout that will have four columns and and two rows so it'll have enough room enough cells the the crossing of the row and column is called cell to allocate eight components right but we can we have only seven so fine one of them will be empty how to do something like this you again you create a panel in this case it doesn't have to be a panel if you create a container then you create an instance of the grid layout then you assign this layout to the container right and after that you're going to be adding components components will be added to the to the cells as you add them to the container this will be the set the first cell zero zero coordinates zero one one zero one one two zero two one and so on so this is how it's going to be done finally finally you will uh, run the program and it'll show this uh, calculator i think i i misled you it should be zero one two three four rows and two columns right so zero uh, zero zero one one zero one one two zero two one three zero three one coordinates of these cells so if you will run this program and, and the user will grab the corner of this calculator and will will start stretching the window the calculator calculator will grow but the layout will remain the same i'll show it to you soon if you don't want to allow this behavior say you don't want to allow user to stretch your calculator then you can say set resizable faults in which case it won't be stretchable let's see it in action so we need to download the source code of lesson one which i already did from the textbook site right as uh, as we did in the previous lessons and then we need to run the program called sample calculator let me go to eclipse right click import I need to import existing project into workspace 
and my archive is called um, Lesson 8. It should be in download. Yes, Lesson 8. Import it. And let's see what we got. Actually, let me do Hello World first. Hello World. Right click, run as just one class. See there? Empty window. That's the one. Hello world. Hello world. Now, to be able to close the window, to make the button, this cross in Windows or this red bullet in Mac work, you need to do something special about it. And we'll talk about it a bit later, how to close the screen. For now, it's hanging in memory, that program, so I'll kill it from Eclipse. Let's do the simple calculator. Simple calculator is the one that uses flow layout, right? I showed this code on the slide. It's still one class. There's nothing too complicated about it. And let's see what we are importing. We are importing components which are sitting for in the Java X swing. And this layout manager, it's sitting in the package java.awt. Let's run it. Run as. See this calculator? Flow layout. Ugly looking calculator, right? But it's. It is what it is. We decided to use the flow layout. So, what do you expect? It. Let's see how it works. I will grab the corner of this window and st will start stretching it. Look at this. See, it's wide enough to to allocate two labels and two text fields in the top row and it did it let me keep stretching see it, it allocates more because we have more room on the first row this is what it means by the word float it's floating so obviously this flow layout is not a good solution for many cases but in some cases if you want to say I want to display the content on the screen no matter how big or small the screen is maybe flow layout works for you now let's run a simple calculator with a grid layout again we just covered it in a slide grid layout 4 by 2 one class so that's the entire code again you have to import the grid layout now right click run as java application now the layout is different this is how it looks let me start stretching it see the window gets bigger that but the layout doesn't change we still have a grid of four rows and two columns it's again it's not that great looking calculator but it is what it is what we programmed finally if you will start entering stuff in there will it work first of all it doesn't work second of all it doesn't have any validation we allow to enter any junk in these fields when i click on the button nothing will happen why because we didn't program event we didn't write a code that would react on event when I click on this button, the clicked event was fired under the hood. And uh, if we would create a processing, um, a, the code that would react to this event, maybe something would change on the screen, but we, th we are not there yet. For now, we are just trying to make the UI looking good. And it looks great, I isn't it? maybe not that great but it looks as a grid definitely okay let's move on next layout is so-called border layout what do we have in the border layout in the border layout the screen the container will be divided into imaginary areas south west north and east just like this again these areas are imaginary but north obviously is on top of the screen south in, is on the bottom of the screen and so on if you believe that there is some content that should always stay on top of the screen then add it to the north area of the container with border layout 
something has to be done, and it has to stay on the bottom, say some footer, then add it to the south area. Maybe you want to have some navigation menu on the left of your window, add it to the west area. And the good thing is that you don't have to specify all uh, five of them. If you, s if you don't need to put anything in the east area, don't put anything. Then the center uh, will occupy the, le the all the remaining of the screen to the right. If you don't need to put anything on the west, fine, don't put anything on the west. Then the center will take the entire space in this sandwich between the north and, end and south. And if we will look at this calculator on the bottom, so what can we uh, see or what can we decide? We can decide that most likely we can use the border layout for our next calculator. In the border layout, what would you put on the north area? To me, it's clear that this display field should be always on top regardless of how big or small the calculator is, right? So we, we will put it maybe a text field or a label on the north area of the container. Next, what else do we see? We see a, the whole bunch of buttons over here. These buttons are the same. When you have a number of components which are the same in size, grid is a good candidate for layout. So what is going to happen over here? I believe what we need to do is to add a text field or a label on top and we will add a panel in the center area. So north will go to the, for the display field and center area will go for the panel. In turn, inside the panel we'll have a grid layout. So the, the J-frame, for example, will be controlled by the border layout having north and center populated, but center will be controlled by the grid layout. So we'll have two containers with two different layout managers. Next example, or next layout manager, card layout. What is a card layout? Imagine a deck of playing cards. So only one card is visible, the card that is laying on top. So, but there are many cards in the deck, right? So that's what card layout is about. If you will change the top card, put it inside, then the other card will be visible, right? But only one at a time. So if you have a bunch of containers that you want to show, but only one at a time, then you can use card layout. Imagine a situation when you are using maybe some uh, container with tabs, right? and you want to do navigation by clicking on tabs. So the user click on, the, on one tab and you show one container with some content, one container. The user clicks on, on another tab, that first tab becomes invisible and the other tab becomes visible. This is what it is for card layout. Absolute layout. As I said in the beginning, if you don't want any automatic control of the uh, arrangements on the screen of your component, then use absolute layout. Absolute layout means don't help me out, I will take care of the layout myself. How, how do you ask for it? You say set layout null. Null meaning no layout. In that case, you are on your own, please help yourself. And you create, for example, a button. And then you need to call set bounds on this button and in there you specify the coordinates in pixels of the top left corner of the button in this case 100 to the right and 200 down everything starts with the top left corner of the window which is 0 0 and the width of this button will be 40 pixels and the height of this button will be 20 pixels so this is how it goes and of course you would need to put every other component that you need just like this. Create an instance of the component and set the bounds of the component. And I also want to tell you it's not either or. You can have a large container, say JFrame, with a content that is flowing, but there is a panel inside 
which always stays the same. So within that panel, you would turn off any layout manager and you will have an image that is not supposed to be uh, stretching or making or getting smaller. So you can combine a layout manager. The other layout manager, probably the most complex to use, but it's pretty flexible, is called grid bag layout. Grid bag layout is using an, a helper, so-called, a helper class and with constraints. I'll show you the code pretty soon. So how this works? Again, let's take a look at the calculator. This is how the calculator looked like in the older versions of uh, Microsoft Windows uh, system. What if you want to, to create, it, that, uh, create the calculator that look like this? Uh, pretty recent, we, uh, we did this grid layout, right? No, what was it? It was border uh, layout, right? So in the border layout, we did something like this, and we added this panel to the north. The inner panel, it was a text field to the north and the panel uh, to the center. But you can do it differently, and actually this will be your homework. You can do it using grid bag layout. Grid bag layout allows you to specify, to fine tune, so to speak, every control before you put it on the screen. For example, we, as I said, with, uh, with the grid layout, you use it when you have components of the same size. But in our case, we have buttons which are having the same size, but this top control text field, it doesn't have the same size as button, right? I say it's six times wider. So what you can say though, in the grid bag layout, you can say, I want to add this com control into a cell. It's still grid, right? So we still operate with the uh, cells, but the grid width is equal six. You're saying it's not six in pixels, it's six times wider. You mean you're saying I am adding a cell to the coordinate zero, zero, right? But the width of this cell will be six times wider than other cells. What about the height? You can say the height is equal one. The height is the same as the height of other uh, cells. Fine. Then you put another, then you specify constraints of the other cell. Say, for example, this cell grid uh, with coordinate 1 and 0. What can you specify? You can specify maybe you want to have some paddings inside the cells. Again, size and so on. You'll see it. But the point is, before adding the cell, the content to the cell, you define constraints of this cell. And uh, let's see how it looks like. You create an instance of grid bag layout, like as in this case. You set it to this container, maybe it's a J frame or whatever. Then you need to have to, to create an instance of the second class. And this class is called grid bag constraints. Grid bag constraints is uh, a place which it is not something that is visible, but you uh, you populate its properties with some values, and then you assign it uh, to the to, to every cell. We're, I mean, every cell can have its own set of properties, of course. So, for example, we create a new instance for this grid bag constraints, and then we say, I'm going to be dealing with this cell with coordinates 0x and 0y. Again, these are not coordinates in pixels, but cell number in a grid. So what do I say? I say the height of this particular uh, the, cons the height constraint will be 1, so the same as other cells. The width of the cell will be equal 6, 6 times wider, right? Then, how do you want to fill the space inside uh, the cell? Do you want to fill it vertically and horizontally if the content is smaller than the cell size? Yes, I want to fill it horizontally and vertically, both. Uh, then proportions, uh, proportions of the horizontal space taken by this component, of the vertical space taken by this component. You can read about all that in the API documentation for the grid uh, back constraints class. 
Anyway, so you prepare all these uh, constraints and then you create uh, this instance of the display field. And finally, you need to assign constraints to this field. You're saying, I just prepared an instance that defined all the constraints and I want to, as to apply these constraints to this display field, right? So this is what you do. You're saying to this, uh, GB is a grid uh, is a grid bag layout instance, right? You're saying GB take the display field, take the constraint that I prepared, apply the constraint, so you know how to put it on the screen. And finally, we are adding this display field with assigned country constraints to the to the window. All this you had to do for one, just one cell. If you have 20 cells, you need to do this 20 times. But again, flexibility is, is there. You, need, you can fine tune every cell and make it look differently if it's, this is what you need. Next topic is events and listeners. As I said, there are different types of events. User generated, clicks, mouse moves, and so on. And system generated, paint event the Java uh, runtime decides that it, 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 the window has to be repainted. Or maybe it needs to resize it as a, a result of some programmatic situation. So, a click on the button. If you click on the button, it'll fire an event. And what you need to do, you need to assign so-called listeners to the, uh, to the co UI components. In this particular case, there is a class called Action Listener that is a good fit for reacting to click events. If you'd be needing to react on mouse movement, for example, you'd be assigning different types of uh, listeners. For example, there is a mouse motion listener in Swing. So you need to ask yourself, what event do I care about or which events? and you need to assign appropriate event handlers or event listeners. What's going on under the hood? How Swing renders or communicates with the user? So, say there is somewhere a data processor. It could be local in your machine, maybe you have a, you are running a game, right? Candy, Candy Crush, for example, or Angry Birds. Everything is installed on your computer or maybe a phone or a tab tablet. In that case, you need to have somewhere, uh, some crun uh, cr number crunching engine that will apply the logic of this game. And this is something that's not visible, but it's important. Then you will have some UI, of course, and we have a user. User will do something with the UI. User will try to move these candies on the screen. So, as soon as something is happening on the screen, events are going from UI. Java runtime and uh, its swim component is running all the time. This is a so-called event loop. If event happens, and event will be happening all the time, if you will click on the button or tap on the button on, this, on the uh, mobile devices, event is generated. Will it be processed? I don't know. If your program has an event handler, then it will be processed. So, event arrived. This event loop is picking up the event and it tries to find, do I have a listener for this event? Yes, I do. It will call the listener. Maybe the listener will invoke some data processing, maybe local. Maybe it will need to, to make a request to the server. Then the result of the data is coming back and it has to be displayed again. So, this data processing unit will uh, need to say, I want to refresh the content of this UI component. Again, this loop is always watching. Is there the need to refresh the screen or modify the screen? Yes, it is. So it'll, it'll do this and it'll modify the UI so the user will see the result. And this event loop is going all the time, all the time. And there is a special so-called thread, processing thread, that is taking care of all changes from the UI. So, but the point is, there could be many events that are coming from the UI 
all these events are being placed in a queue and are processed by this event loop sequentially. And on the other hand, if the data is coming in that should be displayed on the screen, on the UI, on the graphical interface, then again, if they are placed on the queue and this event loop is picking up them one by one. Let's look at the example, action listener interface. As I said, it's a good fit for processing click events. Mm. We need to learn a new buzzword, callback. It's a technical term, which means that there is a, if we say that there is a callback method, it means that we are not going to be calling the method on ourselves. Our program will not be calling it. The environment will call the method in our program. It sounds weird, right? So we are saying this is a method, but I will never explicitly call it. But when the time comes, the Java runtime will call it for me in my program. So callbacks is a code that you specify but never call. Why would we need something like this? Because this is how event-driven programming works. You try to think, what events do I care about? If I care about event uh, button clicks, then you create a callback method. Technically, you're saying, here's a method for you, Java Runtime. I don't know if the user will ever click on the event, but if they will, then at least you will know what to do. If the user will click on the event, on the button, and you created event listener for it with a callback method, the callback method is, in this case, action performed, then Java Runtime will call this method for you and execute the code that you put in there. If you care about mouse events, then you would need to um, use addition, another listener, maybe mouth motion listener, and then you would need to see what callbacks have to be implemented there. But the simplest one is action listener, which is an interface, and it declares in there only one method, action perform. So we know if we are dealing with interfaces, and if my class, say calculator, will implement an interface, it's my goal to implement all methods declared in there. In this case, it's only one. So for example, let's say to separate UI, graphic UI code, and uh, processing code, I will create a separate class. So one class will be called calculator.java, the other class will be called, in my case, I decided to call it calculator engine. That class will not have anything to do, any GUI components, but it has processing. On the other hand, calculator class will ha not have processing logic, but it'll have GUI components. These two classes will talk to each other, and I'll show you how. For now, let's assume that my class with business logic will be called calculator engine and in there I will be declaring listeners to the event or events so calculator engine class implements action listener which means that I must write some code into the method action perform again this is a callback method you will not find any place where I explicitly invoke this method. It'll be called on the, the instance of calculator engine if the user will decide to click on a button. That's the nature of any callbacks. And uh, I believe it's a good time to talk about a design pattern called MVC or model view controller. Design patterns are usually they are patterns, of course, uh, which were created based on the experience of many, many programmers that had to solve uh, similar tasks. On many projects, different programmers in different countries, they, they had to do repeatedly the same things all over and over again. They, for example, 
they had to split the application code into areas. One area that deals with UI, the other area that deals with processing of the, of the event that happens on the UI, and the other area maybe that deals with data. Maybe it reads the database, maybe it reads the files, or maybe it saves in the database or files. So the idea was, let's create a pattern and call it MVC. So at least when programmers talk to each other, uh, they, they can use these terms and they will say, you know what, we, th we, will, use, we will use MVC pattern in this project, which could mean that we will create class or classes that will be responsible for views letter V is for views, for the GUI. Model is, means that we will create some place which will be responsible for model. Model is the data, always the data. Uh, maybe model is uh, an array with some data, or maybe it's a variable, or maybe it's something sitting on the server, uh, even sitting in the database. I mean, something that is populated from the database. Anyway, model is about data. And controller, C, controller. Controller is something that brings together the model and the view. For example, we have a calculator. It plays the role of the view in our design pattern. Some events are happening. And the second class, I decided to call it calculator engine. It'll play the role of the controller. Processing is in there. If I had some data, which I don't, in this example, in this calculator, then I would create another class and I would store data in there, right? Imagine if it's a game and you want to, uh, to store scores of the players, then maybe you would introduce another layer or another class that, is, that would belong to the model tier. Model, view, controller. For now, remember that. We'll have a couple of situations when we'll be talking about MVC again. But this is pretty much the, ens the essence of what MVC is. Separation of, uh, pro of classes. Or separation of code, I would say. Some code deals with uh, viewing, some code with data, and some code with processing. Let's see. How do you register GUI components with their event listeners? First of all, after you will create a class calculator engine that implements action listener, inside the calculator class, you will instantiate it. And check this out. Calculator wants to create its engine, and it passes the reference to itself. Obviously, understand that we are dealing with constructor over here. and what can we guess by looking at this code, at this line? We can guess that there is a class called calculator engine, which has a constructor, which takes one argument of type calculator, because we are sitting inside the calculator now. So calculator expect to get a reference, sorry, calculator engine expects to receive a reference to the calculator. Why? Because it wants to uh, update the UI with results of processing. So calculator is nice looking UI. The user click on the button, event happens. Who is the listener? Register listener. Mm. Calculator engine. See, we are saying, say we have a bunch of buttons inside the calculator. We are saying to the button zero, your action listener is calc engine. So if something happens to you, the, uh, the Java runtime will try to find and invoke the callback from action listener. Which callback? Action perform, right? So whatever code you will write inside the action perform will be invoked. And again, button one has also event listener, so it wants it need, it needs to react to to events with the button. Where is the code to react inside the calc engine and so on? Eventually, inside the calc engine, we will do some calculations and we want to display results in the screen, right? So 
we need some, this instance of the calculator engine needs to know where is the view, where is, where should I send the, the data, right? So, and that's the reason why during creation of the instance of calc engine, we passed the reference to the view, to the calculator instance. So, by using this reference, the engine will be able to send the data to the view. Now, let's see. The calculator view will have a bunch of buttons. And the user can click on any of them. And of course, depending on which button the user clicked on, the processing will be different. Let's see how, how it goes. Class calculator engine implements action listener. Because of that, we have to uh, write the code in the action perform. Action perform will be called. This callback will be called. And the Java runtime will pass parameter, action event in this case. Action event will have inside some useful information about the event, what happened. So we know that whenever Java runtime will call this method, we'll get this argument. And we can query this argument. We can, uh, we can ask this object, what happened? And get source method will tell you what was the source or the reason of the event? If you have 10 buttons, we can figure out which button was triggering this event. Look at this. We call it casting, right? You learned it already in the previous lesson. We know. We are saying, I know that get source method can return any object, but I definitely know that on my application it's going to be nothing else but the button. So we cast it to J button, right? And then we try to query, what's the text on you? Every button will have some text, zero, one, two, three, maybe equal. So we will, we are querying, we are trying to get the label on the button. We are saying, give me the, give me your label. And then in this case, I just display it just to prove that yes, I reacted on the click and I know what button was clicked on. So there is a special uh, class in Swing called J Option Pane. If you want to display a pop-up, a dialogue, as we call it, uh, a message to the user, you, you say J Option Pane dot show dialog. There is a whole bunch of methods to show different types of uh, pop-ups, and in this case, I am saying uh, show conf confirm dialog. Uh, it'll ask for confirmation. A little, a little message box. It will have a button to confirm. So in there, I, I, I will show you pressed. I will attach the label that I figured out and just to test. So, so I hope you get the point. But now again, I want to stress this situation, how, can we can, how two instances of objects can talk to each other. We need to pass references of one object to the other. As in here, calculator, calculator engine. Check this out. We are instantiating a class B from class A. Calculator engine from calculator. And we are passing this, which points at the instance of class A, calculator. What are we doing there? We need to, inside the constructor of uh, this calculator engine, we need to store it somewhere in the variables, this reference that we receive. So later on we can use it. Say we will create a variable parent inside the calculator engine and we will assign this reference to the parent, right? The time came, we calculated, maybe they wanted to add two numbers, the calculator engine added two numbers together and it needs to send back the results to show it on, the, on that display field, on the UI. One of the way, and I marked it as a bad practice, really, really bad. But I want you to see the bad practice. So if you know that the class calculator has a field inside uh, named display field, right? And if we want to get uh, the content of that display field or maybe to put something in there, we can use get text or set text from there. So what's so bad about it? I am sitting inside the class calculator engine and I want to get the content of that field and I know that the field is there. So what's so bad? The bad thing is that 
we need to, to use so-called encapsulation. We need to hide data. We need to use public API. We need to expose only the things that are safe to expose. Like with the car, remember? On the car panel, you have only so many, uh, so many handles and three pedals down there and the wheel. But there are tons of what's going on inside. And we don't want everything to be exposed. What can go wrong if I will use this? Parent.displayField.getText. What if later on I will decide that in the class calculator, I don't want to use a sim simple display field. I want to use uh, maybe a different component, text area. So it'll, or maybe a drop down. So it'll keep remembering all the actions that I did in this calculator. I hope you've seen some some of these calculators with like little white tape that is going out where uh, all the history of calculation is being saved. So if I decide to change the displayed field in the calculator, and if I used something like this in the cal calculator engine, then I will need to change the calculator display text, one control for the other, and then I need to go to come here and change this code as well, because maybe this drop down doesn't even have the method get text. See, breaking, uh, so changing something in class A will break code in class B. Why? Because the class B was trying to use directly internals of the class A. So what's the better way? The better way is to, to create a public API on the calculator class in this case, class A. So you can create a method, a public method on the class calculator set display value or get display value. See, in this case, we are not saying, we are not uh, revealing to the world what components do I have inside. I'm saying, if you need to get the value from the display field, call this method for me, on me, and I'll give it to you. Where is that? It's none of your business. I'll give it to you. If you want to give me the result of the calculation, nice, call set display value on the class calculator and give me what you want to show. Where exactly? None of your business. I know where to show. Do you feel the difference? If in this scenario I will decide to change the control, the GUI control that I use inside the calculator to display data, I need to change it only inside the, inside the class calculator. The other classes, the engine was using get display value, set display value value. It'll still be using it. They are not broken anymore. But of course, how do I set display value? I will have to fix, but it will be done locally inside the class calculator. So uh, always think what should be private, what should be public, what public interface you want to give on the class to make sure that uh, the minimum of internal information is exposed. And this is how, how ca this can be done. We have a private field, display field, right? And we have two public methods, set display value and get display value, right? So what do we do inside? It's our business. The rest of the world will not know that I am actually, what type of the variable display field is this. Why? Because it's private. Okay, walks through number two. Download and import the code from the lesson 9 and review it with instructor. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I need to go to this textbook. To this textbooks, right? Download code. Lesson 9. Where is lesson 9? It's right there. Click to download. It is downloaded. Going to Eclipse. Let's import it. Import. Existing project into workspace. Fine. Browse. Lesson 9. Open. Finish. All right, we got lesson 9. Let me close these files. So what do we get there? Calculator. And calculator engine, right? Let's see. So what our slides instruct us to do. 
run the calculated program and see if the button reacts on the click. And actually, we need to review the code. All right, with instructor. I am the instructor. So let's review the code. Today I am the, the instructor. Maybe tomorrow you will be the instructor and I will be your student. So class calculator, it has a whole bunch of buttons and a panel. Right? Now, it has this public API, as we just discussed, to get and set display value. We have a constructor, which creates a panel, line 41, which creates a border layout and assigns to the panel. Then we create a display field and add it to the north area. Remember the north area of the border layout. It will always stay on north. Then I create a whole bunch of buttons and put them inside the panel. The panel inside will be controlled by the grid layout, right? So this frame, the J frame will be controlled by the border layout, but the panel inside will be controlled by the grid layout. Border layout for the frame and grid layout for the panel. Then we throw all these buttons inside the panel. Then we create the instance of the calculator engine class, passing the reference to me calculator. And then we added a bunch of listeners to several buttons, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Not all of them, pay attention, some of them. I did it on purpose. Then I added the panel to the to J frame. And um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we I added the panel to the center, right? S remember that border layout. Then I created a new frame with a panel. Finally, what do I do? I do frame pack. Frame pack, actual method pack means you have a container, make it as small as possible, but small but big enough to allocate all components that are in there, like a m minimalistic approach, and make it visible. Done. That's the UI. Check this out. There is no processing. There is only UI, model view controller. This is a view. We are not processing anything in there. We just created, added buttons, laid them out nicely, and we said, who is your processor? Who is your listener? We created an instance of calculator engine and give it and pass this to it and do whatever you want with my data. But also, we provided them these, the wheel, the pedals on the in the car, right? We, we provided them public interface to this, to, so they can get data from me and they can give data to me where, where I'm gonna put it in the private field on top of the calculator. Let's go to the calc engine. It's a small class. Implement action li listener. Hence, we must implement the callback action performed. Constructor. What do we do in the constructor? In the constructor, we are receiving the reference to the parent. I use the word parent. Parent. It's not technically a parent. They are siblings. But whoever created the engine, I call it a parent. So I'm just storing the argument in this parent, parent is having type calculator, right? Because calculator is a guy who will be always creating engine and calculator is a guy that needs data from the engine. So the variable parent remembers where the instance of the calculator is. And whenever the callback will be called, when? I don't know. Whenever the user will click on it, on the button. Will the, this callback always be invoked? Maybe not. If the user will never click on the button, or if the user will click on the button, which does not have a listener assigned to it, right? So, but if everything is uh, hunky-dory and the user clicked on the button, we need uh, this method will be invoked and will be given an object of type action event, which inside will have some useful information, in particular. It'll, I can call the method get source, so to figure out which button was clicked. 
and then I want to take based on the, what it was accounted on the bottom. It was one or two or three or four. I want to show it, right? So the user clicked on the button. I want to display it in the field. So, but I don't want to erase whatever was entered before. So what do I do? I say to the parent, please give me what you already have for now, by now, get display value, right? And then I get the label from the clicked button. And then I uh, concatenate, I attached whatever was there already entered in the display field. I attach a newly, new label from the newly clicked button and I send it back to the parent. I call the message set display value. I concatenate it, I attach to the end the newly clicked digit or maybe it, it wouldn't be a digit, maybe uh, it will be a dot, a period. And I send it back to the parent. The parent will receive a method called set display value. Sorry, this one. Set display value and will obediently put it on the screen in the display field, whatever the engine gave to it. Easy. Easy peasy. Right click, run as Java application. Beautiful, beautiful calculator. Right? One. It works. Two, it works. Three, it works. How about nine? No. Eight, no. Zero, works. Five, no. Why? I guess you know why, right? Why? Because he, we forgot. We are stupid. We forgot to assign the listeners to every button. We assign them only to, to the button zero, one, two, three, and four. That's why other buttons don't work. Events are being triggered under the hood. Java runtime says, my job is to trigger event. The user clicked on the button, I will trigger an event. But since there is no listener, this event is not being handled. This is how it works. Moving on. Other layouts. Box layout. Box layout, imagine you have a box, narrow box, and you put in there stuff. So every everything that you put in there go, goes on top of each other. So in this case, <sighs> actually, to be honest, you can do it either vertically or you can have a horizontal box, so you can push stuff in there. But the point is, everything that you add will be laid out. In this case, it's vertical. Let's see. create a frame, right? And uh, by the way, this is something that we never did before, but something that we need to do. Remember I told you when we created this hello world, when we click on the little red dot in the corner on Mac of the window, or maybe if you, you are using uh, Windows operational system, you will be click on that little cross on the title bar of the window. It won't work unless you do something about it. One of the way to do that, to make it work is when you create a frame, you, you need to say set default close operation. And in, you need to say jframe.exit and close. So whenever they will click on this little button or little cross in Windows, the window will be closed and the program will be finished. Anyway, set content to the pane, right? We added the content. And we said, I want to set layout, right? Oh, see, this is uh, improperly laid out on the slide. It should be pane dot add content to the pane. Or let's see what we do over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then we, we, we say pane dot set layout. On the fly, we create new box layout for the pain, for the variable pain, right? And uh, we, we just add the buttons in there and the buttons are, are falling down in this box, one on top of the other. This is a link that you can read uh, to learn more about the box layout. And this is pretty much it for today. Homework, I, I want you to 
get familiar on your own with the grid bag layout. And then do the assignment from the textbook from lesson eight and nine. It, it, it's going to be about the same calculator, but I want you to replace, I mean, to change the way you do layout of the, of the calculator class, of the GUI. You, we've been using water layout with a panel inside with a grid layout, but I want to replace it. I want you to create an instance of grid bag layout and an instance of the uh, grid bag constraints, and the entire calculator should be handled or managed by the grid bag layout. Of course, you're welcome to read tutorial on Swing, which is published online. And when everything is worked, try to see if you can do something with a box layout. Can you apply it over there somehow? And so on. Finally, as an additional read, I highly recommend you to learn about another design pattern. We already learned about MVC model view controller, but there is another pattern which is applicable to the event driven programming, and this pattern is called Observer. If you will learn it, uh, Lars Vogel is a, uh, is a person who publishes lots of nice Java tutorials, and this is one of them. So, read how you can create a class that performs the roles of um, Observer. And there is something called observable. So if you, if you need to program classes when one event can s one class can send notification to the other about some important event, so you can use observer observable pattern. So one class will register with the other, and it will be watching or waiting for some events. That's it for today. Thank you very much. My name is Yakov Payne, and it was the lesson number five for my Java uh, training, Java Intro to Java training. Thank you very much.